So, yeah, welcome once again to the second of a series of kind of speakers that we are inviting at East Point Peace Academy called Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, we just had our first call last week with the kind of legendary nonviolence trainer, George Lakey, about the importance of creating vision in these times. Um, and today we are really, really excited to have Erica Chenoweth, who it looks like many of you are uh, already familiar with her work. Um, I first came into awareness of her work actually towards the very latter stages of the Occupy movement, and I was very upset because I really, really wish I had known about Erica's work during the height of Occupy because I, like perhaps many people, were heavily involved in lots and lots of really heated debates about the effectiveness of nonviolence. Um, and uh, I only found out about Erica's work uh, towards the very tail end of that and has been a fan of Erica's for a long time. And then uh, I, don't, I think it was a couple of years after the Occupy, I got a chance to, to meet Erica and spend some time with her at a week-long training hosted by the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. And one of the things that I was really, really blown away by was, you know, knowing Erica as this amazing scholar and educator and author, um, the time that I got to spend with her, I got to really see how much heart she brought to the work of nonviolence, not just like the intellect and the data and the statistics, but um, as someone who brings so much heart into the, the kind of spreading of the, the knowledge of, of nonviolence and nonviolent civil resistance. And so it's definitely been one of my nonviolent idols and heroes and sheroes since then. So, um, and, and particularly given the, the kind of subject matter in the area of her expertise, I think a lot of people are really, really looking forward to hearing some of her wisdom. So, uh, Again, uh, throughout the call, please feel free to continue to enter questions for her in the chat box. And if you have any tech questions, I also just want to very briefly introduce Astrid, who will be our tech support person. So Astrid, if you want to wave your hand and say a few words. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Astrid, and if you have any problem, you can search for me in the uh, manage participant, I guess, participants list, and you can email me. I'm a core, um, message me. I'm a core member of East Point, and again, really happy to be here with you. So with that, I will hand the mic over to Erica, and she'll present for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to have a few announcements and break into small groups and then come back for a Q&A. So yeah, with that, I'll hand the mic to Erica. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Kazu and uh, Astrid and everybody at the East, East Point Peace Academy uh, for setting this up. And thanks to all of you who are joining um, from all over the world, looks like. And uh, first thing to say is just that I hope that you're all well uh, and healthy where you are and that your families are faring well, uh, that your loved ones are faring well. And, um, you know, I just, I feel like I have a really big heart for everybody right now who's, who's struggling in lots of ways uh, because of our, our current situation. We're all in it together. And, um, and I feel very lucky that I get to sit in front of a computer and connect with you um, a little bit tonight and hope that we have an interesting uh, conversation among us about ways um, that the world is, is showing up in this moment. Um, creating innovative and new ways to connect, to engage and transform our political and social and economic relationships um, during these times. So what I wanted to do is first talk a little bit about some general insights that um, the last 15 years or so of scholarship on nonviolent resistance movements has produced around what makes those movements succeed and then talk a little bit about um, why this current moment can be viewed as challenging given those insights for nonviolent movements. But then I wanna talk about uh, the ways in which the current moment can actually be a really important opportunity um, for uh, stock taking around the things that have been working and haven't been working well for movements around the world. Um, it can be an important moment for innovating new techniques of nonviolent struggle new visions, as I, I guess George Lakey talked about uh, last week, uh, and also um, 
providing movements an opportunity to regroup and start to build new strategies that build on the fact that our current time is seeing a real convergence in people's understandings about what the, the nature of the core issues are that we face together, um, whether it is um, inequality um, around class and race, whether it's about um, public health and access to affordable uh, and comprehensive um, health care, whether it's uh, the climate crisis, and a number of other things um, that are now becoming crystal clear in a much broader range of, of people uh, across the world. And so um, this is a, a moment, much like many other moments, uh, out of which mass movements have emerged, um, where the crisis itself is both um, providing the catalyst for um, really innovative and creative nonviolent action and, uh, and the, the sort of ends that people will seek through those, those nonviolent movements. So first, um, like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the things that we know about um, the, the ways that nonviolent mass movements succeed. And, and what I'm gonna do is talk in a fairly general way about um, some work that I've done, but also work that many other scholars have since done um, using pretty systematic analyses of, um, of, of data on mass movements around the world, uh, both those that are seeking kind of maximalist goals like, um, like independence or national liberation or um, democracy or um, trying to bring about more reformist goals uh, like changes in electoral rules, um, changes against, uh, changes to kind of discriminatory practices, uh, wage reforms and, and labor organizing, things along those lines. And a lot of that research has really, I think, produced four different consensus findings about the ways that mass movements succeed. The first of which is that um, mass movements succeed when they are truly mass movements. That is to say, the bigger they get, the more likely they are to win. And in fact, um, when I say that, I mean that the movements are large in terms of their size, but also um, that they are broad based in that they cut across different cleavages in the society, whether it's that the most salient cleavages are social, um, uh, kind of racial, urban, rural, uh, class divisions, um, ethnic divisions, uh, intergenerational divisions, and things along those lines. So if they're really broadly representative movements that are very large, then they tend to have um, a much greater chance of creating real political power uh, through leverage points that come from the different networks uh, that people are related to from within the movement. And um, when I say that uh, the movement is mass, that means that there's some kind of active investment or active participation uh, by a, a broad number of people. So not just support or kind of symbolic sympathy, but real um, active participation uh, in the movement's activities. And um, movements do well when they uh, achieve large scale participation, but also when they maintain it. Um, and they maintain momentum. So some more recent research um, by myself and Margarita Belgioso has actually found that there's a really straightforward way for movements to gauge where they are um, in terms of momentum. And that's just basically multiplying the number of people who have been actively visibly involved in a movement's activities on any given day and multiply that by the number of actions that the movement has held over the previous seven days. And um, although that sounds maybe really simplistic, it's a really crude way of applying the, the, the sort of physics property of momentum, which is mass times velocity. And if you think about mass as being size and velocity as being the, the sort of concentration of actions in time, um, it turns out that that's a really useful way for movements to um, kind of measure how, um, how much momentum they have. And it's a really strong predictor of, of whether, whether movements succeed on any given day, actually. So uh, size and momentum are sort of related and, then, and kind of connected to one another. The second thing that movements do um, that succeed uh, 
is that they create defections. And by defections, I mean that they start to chip away at the opponent's pillars of support or the adversary's pillars of support. And when I say the term adversary, I don't actually mean it in an adversarial way. Uh, I just mean the, the sort of target of the movement um, in terms of what it's trying to change. And so uh, basically, um, the idea is that any system that's being opposed has lots of different pillars of support. So if it's like a corporation that a movement is targeting, they've got shareholders, they've got um, employees, they've got uh, kind of distribution workers, they've got uh, middle managers and executives, they have trustees, they have consumers, um, and lots of people that kind of support the infrastructure of the business. And all of those are different pillars of support whose active cooperation is required to maintain the status quo. <clears throat> and um, the, the theory of, of nonviolent action that sort of flowed from um, Richard Gregg um, and Gandhi to, um, to Hannah Arendt and Jean Sharp and sort of later down the line is that basically movements succeed when they're able to um, dislocate the opponent from those various pillars. So if it's a dictatorship or even a, a democratically elected government, the idea is that there are multiple different kind of political, economic, social, um, bureaucratic elites that are keeping that system in power and that um, movements win when they start to pull them, those supporters away. Um, and they don't necessarily have to fully defect to the movement, but they have to stop participating and contributing to the status quo. So there are some really dramatic uh, moments of this in cases like uh, Serbia and Ukraine and other places where security forces have been that crucial pillar and have defected in key moments and refused to cooperate with orders to fire on demonstrators. But um, sometimes um, other pillars are like economic and business elites, like in South Africa, where the main, <clears throat> the main uh, consequential pillar was the business community that refused to continue supporting the apartheid regime, uh, not because they necessarily felt like the country would be more stable without the apartheid regime or prosperous, but because they felt like they could no longer afford to do business in a country against whom there were massive international sanctions and um, boycotts of, of white, white owned businesses by um, people organizing in black townships. And so uh, ultimately um, movements that succeed find different pillars of, of support and start to make it too costly for them to continue supporting the status quo. Um, and the key for movements to think about there is finding, is sort of exploiting the networks that the movement has through its broad-based participation, um, and also just keeping the pressure on uh, so that passive allies move into an active allyship position, um, passive opponents become neutral, um, and neutral people might turn into slightly sympathetic or even active allies of the movement. Um, so it's less about confronting the authority, the, the, the direct opponent uh, directly, and it's more about kind of nudging each pillar one tick closer to the movement in terms of its position. The third thing that successful movements do is they, they tend to uh, innovate lots of different creative techniques of nonviolent action that aren't just mass demonstrations and protests. So um, we, we've become very familiar at this point with, uh, with dramatic photos um, that are on the front pages of newspapers that become kind of iconic um, when we talk about the, the, the climaxes of different mass movements. And they're often pictures of hundreds of thousands of people gathered in, in the streets. And in fact, many people in their minds associate those types of dramatic moments with, um, with what makes nonviolent resistance movements succeed in the first place. But in fact, um, uh, mass demonstrations are one snapshot, one of many hundreds or even thousands of different techniques of nonviolent action that people have innovated. And they're not always the most effective uh, or the most powerful in part because um, they become very predictable over time. Uh, and because they can, uh, they can become so routine that, that they no longer create the dramatic effect uh, 
that um, the movement is seeking. And so most uh, movements that have succeeded have actually shifted into using uh, methods of mass non-cooperation. So these are economic non-cooperation techniques like strikes or limited strikes or walkouts or boycotts, um, stay at homes paired with, with general strikes. And, um, and th those have been the things that have really started to change the behavior of those pillars of support uh, because they recognize the movement has economic leverage, disruptive power, not just symbolic power uh, in the streets. And the other thing is that it's much more difficult for the, re for the regimes or the opponents of these movements to repress them when they are engaged in non-cooperation than it is to repress them when they're out in the open um, in large numbers where they can be easily surrounded um, and kind of thrown into chaos. And then the fourth thing that successful movements do is that they tend to maintain their discipline even when backlash increases against them, whether that backlash is from counter protesters or whether it's from the opponents themselves. And so um, movements tend to be the most successful when they both uh, anticipate and expect backlash as a function of their success, in fact, um, that they are threatening the status quo to the extent that there is backlash. Um, and uh, that they have a, a plan to kind of absorb it and maneuver in spite of it, um, or even uh, potentially in a, in a way benefit from the injustice of it um, to, to sort of build their, their case uh, for legitimacy and to build the number of people that support them actively. So it's usually not a good idea for movements uh, to deliberately illicit repression, but uh, repression against movements doesn't necessarily doom them when they're very well organized and can anticipate and respond to repression effectively. So um, I've talked about the four things that, that make uh, that successful movements do well. They, they gather in large numbers of people that cut across a broad base of society uh, to assert direct pressure on the opponent's pillars of support to withhold their cooperation from that system. They vary their methods so that they're shifting uh, and, and sequencing their tactics between um, concentrated methods like demonstrations and dispersed methods like um, withholding labor. And um, they remain resilient and disciplined uh, even when things get very difficult. And so, Given that we know these are the things that movements do when they succeed, um, you know, organizing and mobilizing in a context of a pandemic uh, where people have really urgent um, kind of medical and economic and sort of hardship circumstances that they're facing um, is really difficult. And then you have added on to it um, a number of restrictions about gathering and then add on to that the fact that many governments over the past 15 years have already been dismantling a lot of the different restrictions on their own executive power. Um, and they see this time as a time when there's very little resistance and they can actually further uh, entrench their power um, during this time without, without being noticed or without a, a lot of resistance. And so, you know, you, you would think, um, correctly, uh, that, that movements see this as an extraordinary challenge, especially those that were already sort of fully mobilized. Um, there are cases like in India, for example, where there was, there was sort of a, the beginnings of a movement that many people um, attached a lot of hope to against, um, against Hindu nationalism, right-wing Hindu nationalism there, and there was a sense that this movement had real traction and real momentum, and then, you know, all of a sudden, uh, it's, it's vanished. Um, so I want to make a couple of arguments based on a few observations about the fact that actually this is a time where movements haven't vanished. They, they are still active um, and they've had to adapt a lot of their techniques. Um, the second observation is that it's been a, a, a remarkably innovative time in terms of um, methods of nonviolent action. And I, I and a couple of colleagues have been documenting some of the different techniques people have been using of nonviolent action. And then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, opportunities that movements might have to um, uh, 
to build on the growing awareness of what our main issues are in society. So um, first, uh, the pandemic does make it work, does make it harder for us to, to kind of connect uh, with methods of concentration like mass demonstrations and, and physically proximate protests. Um, but it, it's funny because in fact, over the past 10 years or so, mass movements have actually started to be um, a little less effective in part because they've been relying a lot on these like street demonstrations and mass actions. Um, and uh, in a way, this is kind of forcing movements to regroup and start to use methods that actually paradoxically are more effective like walkouts and strikes and other methods of non-cooperation. I think as a, as a global society, people are rediscovering potentially the power of mass non-cooperation because we can see how um, completely costly it is when people don't go to work um, for one reason or another. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that people um, learn uh, about how powerful their labor is and that they actually have agency in collectively withholding that and it can yield immediate concessions or improvements um, in meaningful ways. I think that that could be an interesting discovery for lots of movements. Um, the second thing is that a lot of movements continue to sort of organize online. And in fact, to some extent, there's a flourishing of, of movement activity and organizing that's taken place. Um, most of the movements that I'm familiar with in the US at least at this point and some in Europe um, are still active. They're doing teach-ins, they're doing lots of strategy sessions and other things um, using Zoom and, and encrypted uh, technology as well. And then the, the second thing is that, as I mentioned, we've seen this real flourishing and new techniques of nonviolent action. I'm actually going to put in the chat uh, a little crowdsourcing document that I've got going with some colleagues at the um, at the Crowd Counting Consortium, which is a, a group that I participate in. Kazu is actually on the um, uh, ethics board of that. Um, and what we what we've done here is we if you look at the tab called list at the bottom, um, you should be able to view that we've we've just started to document all of the different methods that people have been using. Uh, around the world uh, that are nonviolent methods um, just sort of generally categorized as either protest actions, solidarity actions, alternative institutions, non-cooperation, nonviolent intervention, and communications. And it turns out that there are dozens of methods of each of those kinds, um, each of those categories. And, you know, it's funny, a lot of people might be familiar with the, the famous list of Gene Sharp's 198 methods of nonviolent action. Um, and he categorizes them as protest and persuasion, non-cooperation and nonviolent intervention. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Gene Sharp's list of 198 methods, um, is, it's an arbitrary number. He, he didn't necessarily mean to stop at 198, but he was finishing his doctoral thesis at Oxford University and his uh, committee told him that he had to stop <laughs> and, and write the thing and defend it already. And so that's the reason it sort of cuts off at 198. Um, and there's always room to continue adding to the list. Well, I mentioned that because in fact, um, we've already collected 138 methods of nonviolent action that people are using during the pandemic. Um, and so you can sort of scroll through under method. It's, it's not a very pretty sheet yet because we're still crowdsourcing it. If you know of one, send it to me and we'll add it to the sheet. Um, but, uh, and some of you I think have already set, sent us some that we've added to the sheet. Um, but it's really interesting because we know that these times, these emergencies are times when people get very creative. These are life and death situations for people and communities have been responding accordingly. Um, some of my personal favorites are things like solidarity baskets uh, that became uh, really uh, popular and ubiquitous in Italy, um, where basically people would put a picnic basket of food together um, for a family and 
just stack up these picnic baskets on the street corners and people would come and take them. And if they then could fulfill them another time, they would bring them back um, uh, and, and put them down uh, for other people. Um, there have been lots of different methods of non-cooperation, uh, lots of walkouts and strikes um, at workplaces. Uh, a rent strike, uh, 15,000 people in Spain joined a rent strike. There was a sort of a massive action. Um, and these have been popular in lots of major cities in the US. There have been sick ins, people uh, calling in sick. Um, and then there have been lots of different nonviolent interventions, people occupying vacant homes in large numbers, um, engaging in news conferences and contested areas, um, establishing road blockades, um, there have been lots of interesting communications, like people writing manifestos about what the, the future should look like, uh, given our time and the opportunity to rebuild. Um, and there have also been lots of different important teach-ins. Earth Day Live took place, kind of live streamed uh, with lots of different um, contributions of all kinds. And then, of course, um, you've seen the car caravans, uh, the car rallies the boat rallies, the bike rallies, and even some socially distant protests. Um, so we can talk maybe during the Q&A too about people who are just going ahead and engaging in, you know, kind of straightforward uh, socially proximate protests and demonstrations right now uh, who aren't concerned with the sort of public health um, implications of that. Um, but maybe we'll save that for the Q&A. Because the, the last thing I wanted to to just touch on briefly is um, <clears throat> that the, the pandemic has really crystallized, I think, public, con public consciousness about many of the, the issues that have long been on the agendas of progressive and radical movements related to uh, justice for, um, uh, for overcoming uh, racial, ethnic, uh, indigenous, uh, and uh, discrimination against a, a wide variety of, of um, of people and individuals and groups and communities. Um, they've been kind of, you know, the Occupy movement that Kazu talked about is now even more clear uh, and it's sort of, uh, and, and the types of grievances and claims it was making, I think are um, so much more obvious when you see news stories coming out with, um, with Jeff Bezos raking in $75 billion from the first quarter of this year. Um, you know, I think, I, I think these, these are front page news stories now, whereas uh, 15 years ago, um, this wouldn't have really registered as much, I think, uh, broad based concern. There would be people who would be concerned, but, but the concerns are now near universal. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest and, and discussion around climate and the relationship between our current crisis um, to the, the climate crisis. And so, you know, to some extent, I think it's in, in many ways um, an opportunity for movements to really carefully and, and, and thoughtfully put together, um, you know, uh, a vision of the future that's very appealing to a much broader set of people in the country than has been before. And so um, in, in the U.S. at least, um, there, we're, we're, we're entering this in a very polarized time. And so there's you know, a really interesting question about whether we can emerge from this a bit less polarized. Um, and, and my guess is we can, um, and that it's, it, there, are, there are real opportunities here to do that, um, but it's gonna have to come from the bottom up because it's not gonna come from the top down. Um, and my guess is that's probably true from, uh, in many other countries as well at this time. Uh, so with that, I think I'll stop and we have some uh, interesting prompts for you all to consider and for us to discuss together um, after the breakout rooms. I'll just foreshadow them now. Uh, and then I think Kazu is going to make some announcements. So the, the things that I'd, I'd like us to discuss in breakouts are, first of all, what's the most creative method of nonviolent action that you've seen during this crisis? Second, what are the most effective techniques you've seen for relationship building? either offline, online, or some combination during the period of physical distancing? And then what are the most promising opportunities you see for building people power towards transformative change during this time? And um, what we're gonna do is, um, is try to collect your thoughts and um, make them publicly available. So in the breakout rooms, you'll also have access to a Google slide deck uh, 
um, that um, <clears throat> we'll kind of describe in a minute, but the basic idea is just to make sure that the ideas that are shared um, don't just stop with our call, um, but can be added to and can be available as a resource to others. And so while you're thinking these things through, uh, try to think through ways that you can describe them in the slides uh, that also protect people's confidentiality um, and uh, that don't violate any um, kind of consent issues, um, but can be shared in a general way for collective learning um, and that can sort of um, be available to people alongside the call. So I know that uh, many of you know that the East Point Peace Academy is an organization that is committed to a set of principles called the gift economy. And the gift economy uh, means there's lots of things, uh, mainly that we kind of operate under these seven principles of the gift economy, which we're not going to have time to go over right now. Um, but one of the principles that's really important to us is transparency. So many of you know that anyone can go to our website at any point and not only see our budget, but every quarter we update our finances so that you can see exactly how much money we have, see exactly how much money we're making. Um, and the vast majority of our organization's income comes from the community. We're not an organization that's actually founded, funded uh, largely by foundations. So it's really important that um, we're continuing to be in relationship with our community members to support all of our work. Uh, these are just some pictures of our work from the last couple of years. Uh, we have teams of nonviolence trainers in several different prisons across the state of California. Uh, we do work all over the country. Um, and so we do hope that you are able to um, help support us if you are able. Uh, one of the things with the gift economy is, uh, I love this quote that says, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. And I love this image of this young boy feeding a duck and just asking yourself who is getting more joy out of this interaction, the boy or the duck. And so if you do, if you are able to support our work, um, this is the question that we want you to ask, is would it make you happy to support our work, knowing that um, your support is going to support incarcerated communities, uh, young people, a lot of communities who are able to, to pay for participating in our workshops. And so if folks are able to, we invite you to go to eastpointpeace.org and clicking the donate button and giving as much or as little as you can. Uh, we would really appreciate it. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Astrid, who maybe you can uh, repeat the questions out loud and type in the URL for the, the Google Slides into the chat, and then we'll put you all into breakouts. So it looks like most people are starting to come back. So welcome back. I uh, hope you had a good conversation, and def uh, thank you all for using the slides as well, just so we can document a lot of your wisdom. Um, I will be, when I send out the video for this call, I will also be sending out the, the, the thread from the chat box, because Erica um, has added some more resources into that. So feel free to take a look at that now, but know that it will also be emailed to everybody. Um, as well as the link to the, the slides as well. Um, and so we'll open it up uh, for Q&A. We have a little over a half an hour left on the call, so hopefully we'll get through uh, lots of questions. So um, if you have a question, please feel free to either put it into the chat box or use the raise hand feature, um, and we can call on you. And maybe we'll get started with a question that was asked earlier, uh, Erica. Someone was asking uh, their uh, activist and, and organizer in the climate change movement, um, and if you have any examples of what non-cooperation could look like specifically for the climate movement. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the the, the methods of non-cooperation um, generally look like um, in, in economic non-cooperation, it would be um, including things like divesting um, and um, not, um, you know, in, encouraging corporations and uh, and other actors to withhold investments from fossil fuels. Um, it could also look like um, refusing to drive cars. It could look like refusing collectively and mass um, to 
help to restart the airline industry after this time, th things like that. Um, so uh, the, the key with all of these actions is that they're typically much more effective when they happen in very large scale. Um, so when they are, um, you know, many, many numbers of people rather than people doing it as sort of an individual consumer choice. So I guess the key challenge is, is to how to encourage mass non-cooperation rather than non-cooperation at individual institutional or corporate levels. Thank you. Um, I see, uh, and forgive me if I mispronounce people's names, but uh, Rasa? is raising your hand. So I'll go ahead and unmute you. So if you want to, oh, there you go. So yeah, go ahead and. Thank you. Um, so I'm part of the animal rights movement. And I was just wondering, um, in terms of how many people is necessary for us to significantly help animals, just because as you know, vegans is a very, very small percentage of the world. And sometimes it's disheartening. We want to help animals now, but there are just so few even vegans. So I was wondering, do you think it's different from other movements in terms of how many of us is necessary in the animal rights movement to make significant progress, such as get cities or all of California to divest from animal products or something significant like that, and ultimately achieve something huge like what we call animal liberation where for example slaughterhouses will eventually be transitioned to other types of businesses so do you think that uh, we potentially soon might have enough people to to be made to be able to make significant change yeah good question so i'm not sure how many um people are required um, and whether there's a, a, a sort of scientific basis for arguing for a tipping point. Um, and uh, that said, there don't appear to be too many movements that have, that have targeted at least national governments and have failed after achieving about 7% of their participate their um, nationwide participation directly and actively. And usually movements succeed with much fewer um, than that. So um, I think the average um, kind of popular percentage is like 1.8% of the population. Um, uh, it, it typically uh, is a successful movement um, and some have, you know, clearly per, uh, succeeded with even fewer than that number. So that's sort of like large scale movements targeting national uh, governments. We don't know um, whether that kind of threshold effect would hold at movements that are aiming for uh, reformist goals or goals that are targeting state governments or local governments. But, um, you know, I think the, the key takeaway is that most movements that have achieved that threshold of participation have expanded far beyond the sort of uh, core supporters and have managed to pull in people who don't uh, directly identify with the movement at the outset, but decide to take on the movement's goals as its own. And so, you know, I think I'm, I'm not sure about the, the animal rights movement in terms of what the sort of most obvious um, allies are that aren't already engaged in the movement. Um, but uh, I'm sure that there are many people who right now are identifying with, um, uh, with you know, workers in um, kind of you know, meat packing plants right now who are about to go on like massive strikes over workplace conditions and things like that. And so, you know, there are moments of opportunity where even if the coalition isn't obvious or easy, where there can still be considerable leverage added by the fact that there's kind of this confluence of an emergency. So, um, so uh, I'm sorry I can't answer more specifically. Um, we don't have, like I said, too much of a scientific basis for 
answering that question, but I think the general principles still apply, that movements get large, that they cut across the population in a way that pulls in people who aren't obviously um, affiliated with the movement, um, and that they, um, they start to create those defections in key ways. Thank you. There's a, a couple of questions that I've received, but this one feels like it's it's building on the one you were just talking about now. So someone asked, doesn't the 3.5% threshold change if there are active counter movements? It seems that there's an assumption that the other 97% or so aren't doing anything either for or against, but we have conflicting competing movements here in the U.S. Um, I think especially now with, with lots of mobilization happening around Trump and things like that. So I'll be get, curious to get your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I don't think too many movements have actually succeeded in crossing the three and a half percent threshold without having incredibly widespread popular support. Um, I don't know of any cases where there was a movement that mobilized three and a half percent when there was also a, a counter movement mobilized with an equivalent number. Um, so usually having three and a half percent means that the movement has widespread popularity, even if it's a deeply polarized society, they have well over the majority. Um, so, so this isn't necessarily a, a case where you have a, a very loud minority being able to sort of override um, the, the entire kind of public consciousness, including a counter movement. Um, but I think, um, I think you're right to say that if a movement was only trying to kind of hit the three and a half percent rule target without mobilizing a broad base and building a broader organizational infrastructure uh, to support, you know, collective transformation and that there's no guarantee that they would succeed. Um, and there could very well be a counter movement that could kind of hold them in check. Thank you. Uh, I see a couple of people with their hands raised and some more questions coming in through the chat. Uh, I think this is a question that you're probably used to seeing a lot. Um, someone asked, given the importance of nonviolent discipline in the success of movements, uh, do you have any thoughts about how to handle agent provocateurs working to push movement towards violent actions and discrediting them? Yeah, um, I don't know. I guess there are different schools of thought about this one. Um, uh, Politically speaking, the effects of kind of violent flanks or agents provocateurs are basically the same uh, in the sense that, you know, whether the movement kind of has adopted or embraced, um, you know, the idea that some fringe violence, um, sh you know, should be part or can be part of the movement's overall strategy, or whether there's kind of an, a provocateur who's trying to get the movement to do that, like, from the outside, most people will blame the movement one way or the other. So the, the political effects are largely the same. And so um, to that extent, it can simplify it to the degree that the, the strategies for managing the political effects are consistent regardless of like who, whose fault it is, uh, so to speak. And so a lot of this is, is stuff that um, Kazu has written about, I think, really well. And Steve Chase, you might have even been the one asking the question, even though you, uh, you've you also written on this. I think a lot of it is, is um, kind of coming to a, 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 an agreement within the movement about, um, you know, what the sort of range of methods are that, that the movement represents and, um, and then kind of developing um, a strategy for how the movement is going to communicate with the public to keep the focus on the issues um, in the event that some things um, escalate to that degree. Uh, and, you know, some movements, not all movements, but some movements come up with strategies to sort of manage the public discourse and say um, that they denounce um, violence. Uh, and that that isn't possible politically or um, kind of ethically for all movements, but some movements have done that and it has helped them politically. Um, but, you know, one way or the other, there's, there's definitely, um, you know, uh, often a threat of this and it's an age old issue. And um, I think there's a lot of good writing on it other than what I could say here, but um, you should get, check out Kazu's new book and, and, um, and some of Steve's writing on this as well. Thank you for the plug. Um, let's uh, hear 
from David Hartzell, who has his hand raised, and then we'll get back to some of the questions in the chat. Uh, so, David, go ahead. Uh, Eric, thank you so much. Um, for It says you're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. For, for what you've said today and uh, what you've been doing with your life. Um, my question is that I've been active with the Poor People's Campaign that was planning a major um, bringing people all over the country together in June of this year for a major mobilization of people power energy. And now that's had to be canceled uh, to, to become just a virtual uh, gathering. I'd be interested in your thoughts in addition to what you've already said, uh, if you have thoughts about how that can be really, how, how that can be translated into uh, strong people power that uh, the powers that be will have to listen to. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's hard for me to know um, whether whether kind of online gatherings um, that end up being kind of virtual spaces of sharing, learning, encouragement, um, motivation, inspiration, um, you know, how that will end up turning into um, political leverage. And it might be that it doesn't, right, immediately turn into that. It might be that that their moments are more for strategizing and collecting uh, ourselves to like mobilize when the moment presents itself. Um, or it may be that, um, that it translates into more kind of institutional political action for the time being, which is to say, um, focusing on making sure A of all that there is an, elect an election in 2020 and second of all, that people can vote in it. And third of all, that the votes will be counted. Um, so like these are things that can be done remotely and pressure can be placed on people in elected office to make sure those things happen, even though we're now physically distant from one another. Um, but, I, but I do think that um, the question of like whether we can easily translate what was going to be kind of a march or a, a sort of symbolic or even kind of mass gathering into something online that would create um, an equivalent amount of notice and attention. I just don't know. Um, but I also think that it could be, as I said earlier, a really important opportunity um, for figuring out what we want to do together you know, um, and how we're going to go about it when the time comes. So I, I don't know what the Poor People's Movement um, event should or will look like in, in June. I'm sure that the organizers are going to do something amazing, as always, with that event. But I also think that it's okay if the time that we spend together is time thinking, strategizing, and coming up with a plan that's going to work. Thank you. I see lots of good questions coming in. Um, I see Thad uh, typed in a, a question earlier and also has his hand up. So Thad, if you want to unmute yourself and join in the conversation. Sure, great. So uh, my question is this, Erica, early you mentioned, and I was really inspired and hopeful with this, you mentioned that there's a possibility for the United States to emerge less polarized than we are now that excites me, especially after talking about getting broader than, than 3.5%. I'm just wondering like, what, what do you imagine? What, what do you think are some, some you know, key things to work on for that given our, what I call our bipolarizing duopolistic political paradigm? <laughs> yeah, good question. Hmm. I feel like if I had an answer for this question, I'd, I'd be a lot, more hopeful. Uh, if you <laughs> had the answer, you could run for president. If you <laughs> That's a terrifying thought, Thad. So, um, okay, so I think there's a couple things we could think about. Um, the first is, the, one of the things that has been amazing to watch in the United States and worldwide 
is the degree to which people are in fact willing to engage in rapid mutual aid to support their communities. And this is something that's been incredibly unifying and has been able to sort of tap into lots of different frames. It's been able to tap into frames of, you know, collective care and community. It's been able to tap into frames of patriotism. It's been able to tap into frames of like common welfare and emergency. Um, so those are like full political spectrum issues. And um, to the extent that it's helping localities and communities connect in ways that show care and concern for one another, that is a very promising and I think potentially novel thing over the past um, few years. So then the second thing <clears throat> that I think is um, that there is a real possibility for genuine solidarity across what people are calling essential workers, um, uh, what you might call totally unappreciated <laughs> um, uh, skilled workers um, who don't make a living wage, um, there is a, a genuine opportunity for people who are continually put at risk right now um, to make claims about their need for, for collective protection as workers that also totally cuts across political ideology and partisan affiliation. Um, and then I think there's also, um, you know, there's there's a, a chance to start to mend the, the the rural urban divide in the U.S. because this is an issue that's going to affect people regardless of where they live and where they're situated. And so much of our um, kind of disharmony has been related to a real growing kind of um, urban rural division. And um, so I think there is something about kind of honestly collective suffering that can translate into compassion um, and if it's effectively channeled this way like that bridge can also start to be mended and crossed so i think what what i would be doing um, if i had any kind of public position of any kind is i'd be really trying to emphasize the parts of the the situation that everybody has in common across our typical divides. I would be focusing very much on the fact that, um, that this is disproportionately affecting communities of color. And as the Boston Globe reported today, the people with the worst um, uh, experiences with COVID uh, are not just uh, people of color living in communities that are affected by poverty, but also um, that they're in communities where the air is the least clean. And so they're, they're at, the pollution is the highest and that's adding to their respiratory distress. And so all of these different issues are coming together um, in ways that, um, that people should and, and do care about regardless of kind of where they're situated. So of course, what we disagree about is how we should distribute resources and who should be distributing resources to make sure that people are cared for but um, those are uh, those are arguments that are easier to have once we establish the common ground, and there's plenty of it um, that we should be emphasizing over and over again. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I've definitely been enjoying watching all the mutual aid networks pop up and all the support that people are providing to each other. It's really fun to see. Um, there's a, a great question from Alvira here who says that uh, there will always be someone to claim tactics are violent, even things like blocking traffic, disrupting a speech. Some people say those things are violent. So how do you decide on where the line is drawn? Is it just how the average member of the public perceives it? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to figure out whether I should answer this from kind of a research perspective or a a practical one, I guess both ways. So from a research perspective, we're still trying to figure out what people perceive as violent. Um, and a lot of researchers are doing this by basically using vignettes uh, where they either describe or show a picture um, of people engaging in some kind of collective action or dissent. And then they ask people, you know, who are survey subjects like 
do you think this is violent or not? And so we have some <clears throat> information about tactics and the, the general sentiment is that um, tactics that um, are more disruptive um, gen generally by the, as you say, average person who responds to these surveys are more likely to be viewed as violent. Um, Sit-ins, protests, strikes are generally not viewed as violent, but blockades and property destruction, people usually associate with more violence. Um, we also have some research uh, that, that shows some very disturbing reactions from the public vis-a-vis -vis the identity of the, the protesters. Um, and this is less about defining violence and more about defining the threat level of the action to the public and whether the police are justified in using repression or coercion against the protesters. And um, there, at least in the United States and in the Israeli-Palestinian context, there does seem to be evidence that in the US, white respondents are more likely to think police are justified in using repression or coercion against black activists than they are against white activists. And in the Israeli-Palestinian case, Israeli respondents, or Israeli Jewish respondents were more likely to um, say that uh, repression was justified against Palestinian protesters than other protesters. So that's research that's come out lately by other scholars. Um, and um, I think what we can take from this is first of all, um, that, um, you know, there, there's still a lot of kind of controversy about what counts as nonviolent or violent, um, but movements that get larger and pull more people in are more likely to succeed. And so um, that generally uh, translates into the idea that movements um, should pay attention to the, whether the public response to their actions is sympathetic or not. And so if, if the movement is getting larger and pulling more people in, then it's more likely to succeed if people are, ex are kind of being repulsed by the movement. Um, the second thing is uh, about the identity of the demonstrators. So this can be, uh, this is obviously a disturbing finding, but surprises no one who's familiar with institutionalized and internalized racism. Um, and so uh, basically it, this is part of the reason why some activists argue that um, that having a multiracial coalition is really important in pushing for racial justice. So in other words, it shouldn't only be up to people who are in the targeted uh, group to be responsible for pushing for the targeted group's uh, justice. It should be other people too um, who are participating in those movements because then it complicates um, the notion uh, that you know, they should be kind of, the, that they are violent or threatening demonstrators. So it's very, um, uh, this is still a, an emerging field where they're doing a lot of really interesting kind of experimental survey methods. I say from a practical perspective, the, the main takeaway is, is that it, it matters less whether it strictly counts as nonviolent or violent in a context and more about whether more people come to the next action or fewer people come to the next action as a good good judge of, of whether the, 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 the method landed or not. Thank you. Yeah, I remember seeing uh, during the Occupy Oakland protest for a while, every demonstration and every mobilization, like it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then once property destruction entered the picture, the rallies kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller every time. So I think that is a, a great judge of that. Uh, we have about five minutes before we need to keep transitioning. So um, see if we can fit in a couple more here. Um, there's a question kind of building off of what you were just saying uh, around, is, is it helpful to expose the double standard of how like what's viewed as violent and not violent when you see uh, right wing protesters protesting at the Capitol with uh, with uh, open carry and, and um, uh, assault rifles and things like that. So is it ex is it helpful to expose that kind of double standard. Yeah, actually, I'm glad that question got asked because there's there's a couple things I, I can say about this. The first is that there's a really interesting study that came out um, 
by some sociologists at Stanford. Uh, one of them is Rob Willer is the name. And then um, uh, I can't remember the names of the other co-authors. But if you Google Rob Willer Stanford and then look for um, uh, the recent Socius article on protester violence in 2018, so um, they actually did a direct comparison between anti-racist demonstrators and uh, white supremacists. And what they were trying to do is figure out um, whether uh, people increased or decreased their sympathy based on you know, the identity of the demonstrators and whether they use violence or not, whether they were kind of looking like they were using violence or not. And it turned out that the public tended to punish the anti-racists for using violence in terms of their sympathy, but they didn't pun punish the white supremacists. Now they had a much lower sympathy for the white supremacists, but it didn't go down much um, when they use violence. And the explanation these sociologists give for that is that people expect them to be violent. Their rhetoric is violent, their ideology is exclusionary. And so it matches their expectations but when the anti-racist demonstrators were using violence, it violated their expectations and they felt like because they were making an argument based on the moral high ground that they ought to be behaving in a way that drew other people in. And so it, there is a double standard, right? Um, it's, it's totally unjust and also a major part of the political reality um, for lots of movements that struggle with these, with these issues for our current moment. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of movements encounter this um, and it's incredibly frustrating um, and can also be something that the movements can use to better inform the types of strategies that they build, um, just to be aware of, of the double standards and um, try to work to transform them um, while also working, you know, with the understanding that they have an uphill battle to, to fight on that. And I, I also wanna talk about um, the, the reopen protests and the occupation of the Michigan State Capitol today. Um, so one thing I want uh, to say about it is that there have been far fewer of these than you would guess <laughs> based on the media coverage. So um, my colleagues and I at the Crowd Counting Consortium um, I think we've collected data on uh, over about 100 of these protests individually across the country. And among them, there's under than 30,000 people across that whole range of, of actions that have participated. And um, that might sound like a lot, but um, the news coverage has been as if it was, you know, hundreds of thousands of people with guns and, you know, um, engaging in this very surprising action. And in fact, um, there have been some people with, you know, with, with guns, but, um, but by and large, it's been pretty small scale and pretty isolated compared to say, even the Lights for Liberty action that took place in like July of, of 2019, where there were 700 actions and there were 100,000 people who participated. Um, the anti-impeachment protests of December had a couple hundred thousand people demonstrating across 700 locations, um, and they got almost no media coverage at all whatsoever. So um, a couple of us are publishing something at Vox that shows actually the disproportionate media coverage that the reopen protests have gotten per protester size <clears throat> out of 3,300 media uh, sources in the US compared to the very small number of, of uh, of coverage that the, the these other kind of more progressive demonstrations have gotten, and you know, part of part of the issue could be just because people are surprised that there are people who are engaging in socially um, proximate protests right now. Part of it might be the alarming antecedents of the um, Charlottesville action, because many of them have been using the same iconography. Um, and yes, somebody said the astroturfing um, as well has been part of the picture, but also, you know, the president um, is supportive of them. And so like it, it sort of draws the media in a way that um, I think only amplifies the effects of these groups. But in fact, um, you know, they, it pales in comparison uh, to the number of people who have the millions and millions of people who have been doing other forms of nonviolent action during this time. 
um, that aren't making the limelight. And so I would just um, caution people to be careful about over kind of reading overly into the political pressure that can mount um, from these actions, especially if they remain relatively short lived, which I expect them to. And, um, and to, when you can call attention to what else is happening, because that helps uh, to sort of demystify these groups and also to, um, to put the focus back on those who are trying to help right now. Thank you. So there's definitely several good questions that uh, we are not going to have time to get to. So I apologize about that, but I do want to honor everyone's time. So I just want to uh, thank everyone for showing up on this call. And of course, thank you, Erica, for all the work that you are doing in the world. Um, and if you want to transition to any closing thoughts or remarks that you might have. No, the only thing I'd say is I just put the Google slides back up in the chat. Um, some of the breakout groups came up with really great stuff um, and put them in the Google slides and we'll just leave that up, I guess, um, on the website where this video ends up as well and folks can return to it or fill it out um, and then we can sort of lock it um, so that the information can be made available uh, to people who would find it useful to have. And then we've also got some additional resources in the chat for people to check out just for ideas and and inspiration. But thank you so much. And, and like I said, I hope everybody stays well and uh, do take care of yourselves and stay in touch. Cool, thank you so much, Erica. And I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everyone at the same time. So if you all just wanna speak into the, into the room and, and offer your gratitude for Erica. And uh, thank you all again. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon at a future East Point event. So I'm just gonna go ahead and Everyone's unmuted now. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.